the BBC presents My Work. Today's programme, which comes from the Radcliffe Infirmary, situated on one of the busiest streets in Oxford, is introduced by Jack Long. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and the teams taking part are, on my left, Miss Arnott Robertson and Frank Muir, and on my right, Miss Nancy Spain and Dennis Norton. And here's round one, which tests their vocabulary. What I do is to ask each member of the team in turn to explain the meaning of a word and a mark if they get it approximately right. Arnott Robertson, what is moraine? M-O-R-A-I-N-E, Moraine. Tomorrow's weather report. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dirty bit in the middle of the glacier. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the ass. <laughs> well, it can be at the end, it can be at the sides, which are quite right. It's, it's, it's the bits of the mountain, it scrapes off. And that's what a moraine is. <laughs> uh, Dennis Norton, what is Shabine? Shabin is an Irish word. Yes. Yes, it's a sort of um, it's, it's a sort of um, unofficial pub. Quite right. It's an illegal pub, a house where excisable liquors are sold without a license. Nancy Spain, what is a dottle? A oh. dottle is that thing that Frank keeps on trying to knock out of his pipe. Yes. <laughs> it's a little small smouldering bit of burning tobacco or burnt tobacco. And spit. <laughs> you lie, no, that's Donald. spittle. Yes, I do. <laughs> no, that's not doffle, that's spittle. <laughs> well, it's the bit at the bottom of the pipe that you don't normally smoke, and as you say, Frank knocks it out. Frank Muir, what's the meaning of panache? Panache? Panache means, um, uh, well, it's a sort of thing that you walk and behave with. Yes. It's a sort of dash and swagger, and is named after, of course, Beau Nash's father. <laughs> I accept the meaning I unhesitatingly reject the derivation it was probably first used in connection with Cyrano de Bergerac but if you go back far enough it really was a plume or tuft of feathers that you wore on your helmet or as a headdress and from that it came to mean swagger the plume de ma tante at last <laughs> isn't that nice well that brings us on to Round two, which is names and places. And I want to know who or what the following ones were. Arnold Robertson, who was Apollyon? A-P-O-L-L-Y-O-N, Apollyon. Um, isn't he an evil spirit of yes. some kind? I, he, isn't it another name for Lucifer? Or yes. One of, and um, uh, the, the original chap that did the trouble? Yes, the devil. The king yes. of the devils, the lord of the bottomless pit, is what he's called in the book of Revelations. And if you remember, Christian... Fortium um, in Pilgrim's Progress. <coughs> Get your mark. And Dennis Norton, where is pandemonium? It's hell. Yes. Um, and I believe it's where Apollyon used to work out what he was going to do. Yes. And all the, all the other evil. Well done, Dennis. Yes, it is the bottomless pit itself. It's the abode of the demons. It's the capital of hell with the council of the devils. And it's um, very graphically described in that way by Milton in Paradise Lost. It comes to mean confusion, terrible, hopeless, noisy confusion. Nancy Spade, I want to know who was Natty Bumper? Uh, Fenimore Cooper, Deer Stalker. That's it. He's the hero of Fenimore's, Fenimore Cooper's series of tales, the Leather Stocking Tales, and he was, in fact, you probably know him better by his other name, Natty Bumper, he was, in fact, Hawkeye. 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 Yes. Yes, you get your mark. Um, Frank Muir, if Hamlet was Prince of Denmark, who was Fortinbras? He's a character in the play. <laughs> yes, in the Fortinbras, he used to do battle in bronze armour. <laughs> <laughs> he was a prince. Prince of, yes. Yes, he was, was, definitely was a prince of, yes, yes. But I want to know what the country was, you get your mark. It was a, it was a Scandinavian country. Yes, it was. A, a neighbouring Scandinavian country. Good. Um, <laughs> Close as you like. Norway, Sweden. Yes, yes <laughs> Norway. Born in Brass, Prince of Norway. In <laughs> Round 
round three is very serious and difficult. It's all about literature. What I do is to give each member of the team a quotation, one or two lines, and ask them first to complete it, if they can, and afterwards to say where it comes from. Arnold Robertson, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Oh, that's the bard, um, you know, to the last syllable of recorded time. It's Macbeth. Yes, it's Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays... Yes, yes, have like it. Pools, pools, the way to dusty, dusty death. death. Out, out, brief candle and so on. Macbeth himself speaking in Macbeth Egg Cloud. Dennis Norton... Lives of great men all remind us we can make ourselves sublime. Yes, this is a, a favourite bit that they used to sew on samplers. Yes. Now, my embroidery is not what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, lives, of, uh, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. Da 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 da, leave behind us. Yes. Footprints in the sands of time. On the sands of time. On Good. the sands of time. And author? Longfellow. Yes, Longfellow it is. Well done. <laughs> Lives of great men all remind us we can make ourselves sublime and departing leave behind us and footprints on the sands of time. Longfellow's Psalm of Life. Two marks. Nancy Spain. They spoke of progress spiring round, of light and Mrs. Humphrey Ward. It is not true to say I frowned or ran about the room and roared. Well, um, I, I know it's by G.K. Chesterton. Yes. And I think it's called the, the um, something or other to do with Puritans. Yes. But how it goes on for the life of me. In fact, it goes on. It is not true to say I frowned or ran about the room and roared. I might have simply sat and snored. I rose politely in the club and said, I feel a little bored. Will someone take me to a pub? G.K. <laughs> Chesterton, ballad of, the anti of an anti-Puritan. Frank Muir... Far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, their sober wishes never learn to stray. Oh, yes, this is, um, can storied urn or animated bust. Yes. It? <laughs> Perhaps some hairy-headed swine. You know. <laughs> it's, um, uh, Gray's Elegy by Gray. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, can, you, can you prompt me off again? Uh, far uh, from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, their sober wishes never learnt to stray. Um, along the cool, sequestered veil of life, uh, they walked the even tenor of their way. Oh, my God. They kept, stanza. They kept the noiseless tenor of their way. We'll go on to round four. This is about things which look similar but are different, and one mark for knowing the difference. Arnold Robinson, what's the difference between indigent and indigenous? Um... Indigence is hard up, and indigenous means growing where you, where you are. Growing, starting in the country, belonging to the country, yep. belonging to the place where you go. Indigent, needy or poor, indigenous, native or belonging to. One mark. Dennis Norton, the difference between cineraria and cinerarium. A and um. Cineraria and cinerarium. Cinerarium. Yes. A cinerarium... Um, is a cinema where they show widescreen pictures. <laughs> Whereas a cineraria isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Terribly helpful and no marks at all so far. I don't know either of these. Cinerarias. Well, is it a flower? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, a, no. it's an herb. No, no it's, it's a flower. A flower. No, which oh, one's a flower? The flower? Which one. one's, a, one's a flower? Cineraria is the flower. The cinerarium is the repository for the urns which have the ashes of the dead in them. Egg timers, I thought. <laughs> Nancy Spain, I want to know the difference between a curé with an accent acute on the E and a curette, C-U-R-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Well, a, a curé is a sort of clergyman in France bicycling about with one of those berettes on. Yes. And um, a curette. Well, I think it's one of those things with like a spoon that you scrape with. That's it, yes. Small instrument used by a surgeon for scraping, whereas the other is a parish priest in France, Catholic parish priest. One more. Frank Muir, the difference between a eulogy and an elegy. If you want to praise a man and say he looks very cheerful and festive and like a yule log, say that's a eulogy. <laughs> whereas if, if he dies from the shock and you then uh, praise him rather fulsomely after he's dead, before he goes in the, uh, in the cinerarium, cinerarium. Yeah. then that is a, an elegy. Mm. 
In other words, one's, uh, one's uh, praising a dead man. Yes. And eulogies is really praising a live man. Yes, I think that's good enough. It's a speech or writing in praise of a person. Elegy is a song of lamentation. It needn't necessarily praise him, Frank, but it normally does. All right, one more. Around five is about familiar expressions, though there's sometimes some hot dispute about this with members of the team. I want to know, first of all, meaning, and second, derivation, where the expression comes from, so you can possibly get two marks. Arne Frodson, the phrase eavesdropper. An eavesdropper is somebody who listens to what they shouldn't, and I suppose you did it by lying on the roof and putting your head down and being able to listen into the window, thus curving your body in a graceful arc under the eaves. That sounds dangerous. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's worth it, though, Jack. <laughs> I can't see any way by which otherwise uh, listening to conversations which weren't intended for you could be connected with eaves. Um, well, you needn't necessarily be on top of them. Well, all right, you could put, be lying, uh, you could be resting flat against the wall, uh, yes. sheltered by the eaves, all right, and yes, listening right. in at the window. <laughs> Two marks. It is a person who listens secretly and stealthily to somebody else's conversation, and the eaves drop is rather nice. It was it's sometimes called the eaves drip was the space of ground that got the water running off your thatched or other roof. And the eavesdropper was therefore somebody who stood there, probably pretty uncomfortably, so that he could listen at the wall uh, or beside the window to what was going on inside. So he's in jolly well right. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Norton, the phrase, like Caesar's wife. Like Caesar's wife? It must be um, above suspicion. Yes. Caesar's wife, presumably, um... Was, um, was in a position where, where she was not allowed to show interest in, not by so much of a twitch of the toga <laughs> <laughs> in anybody else bar Julius. Yes. Yes. I think, mm. Mm. I think good enough. You've got, it was Julius Caesar because it might have been one of many Caesars. The tale is that it was uh, when his wife, Pompeia, was accused of having an intrigue with another chap called Clodius, Julius Caesar divorced his wife, Pompeia, not because he thought she was guilty, but because Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. Nancy Spade, the phrase, conscience money. Conscience money? Well, it's what you pay all of a sudden for no reason at all, uh, because you feel that you must have done something wrong sometime and taken the money away from someone else. Yes. You see it in the personal columns of the time. Yes, when they... That's getting you to back to the origin. Now, what is the origin? Well, um, when you have a guilty conscience, you send some money. To the income tax, don't you? To the income tax. <laughs> or, 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 for example, if you sort of came down to Oxford for the BBC and you put in expenses for staying the night and you actually went back the same evening. <laughs> <laughs> Then what shall I do? Well, then you'd return it to them in a plain envelope. <laughs> I think before we get any more terrible revelations, we'll give two marks straight away. Um, it is. It's money paid by somebody to somebody else in order to ease your conscience. And it does apparently come uh, originally from this money being paid to the Inland Revenue or the Chancellor of the Exchequer by people who defrauded income tax authorities or, or who have... Uh, said that their income was smaller than in fact it was. That's the first time the expression appears to have been used, and as Nancy Spain rightly suggested, if the Chancellor of the Exchequer does receive some unexpected gifts of this sort, he has to advertise the receipt in the London Gazette. That's always interesting, isn't it, because when, when you see these advertisements that he's received a fiver, you always get the feeling that the chap has actually done him out of about 80,000. <laughs> <laughs> I think he gets the same yeah. feeling. Yeah. <laughs> And, Frankner, the phrase, post-haste. With all possible dispatch. Yes. <laughs> it's usually, for, usually uh, in the connotation of travel, of movement. Yes. And, uh, one mark, and uh, <laughs> post-haste from the post, from uh, carrying the post. Yeah, and how did you carry the post? How far back do you want? <laughs> I think <laughs> originally, oh, it's on the right originally from horse to horse. In 12, That's it. Twelve mile legs, I believe. That's it. It's when the post didn't go in these um, British Railways ways, 
but with the post was a number of individual horsemen posted along the route. I, I didn't know it was 12 miles apart, but uh, Frank's probably quite right in it. Well, was. if he tells you, it's, it's, it's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a especially good way at that time of taking urgent letters from one place to another, because when one horse got tired, you passed on to another one. And so on to round six. And round six is about writers' styles, and what I want each member of the team to do is to try and identify the author, and they possibly can the book too, um, from the bit that I'm going to read, the style of writing. Two marks if they get both the writer and the book it comes from, otherwise one for each half. Aunt Robertson, I never nursed a dear gazelle to glad me with its soft black eye, but when it came to know me well and love me, it was sure to marry a market gardener. Hood. No, it's not a bad shot, Arnold, but I don't think I can give any marks. The original was Thomas Moore, Lalo Rook, oh. but the misquotation, that is, instead of ending up uh, and love me, it was sure to die, but to, sure to marry a market gardener, is Dickens, the old curiosity shop, and it's Dick Swiveller speaking. Uh, Dennis Norton, I went out to Charing Cross to see Major General Harrison hang, drawn, and quartered, which was done there, he looking as cheerful as any man could do in that condition. Non-fiction? In, in, uh, did he go out to Charing yes. Cross? Non-fiction. Yeah. Well, a diarist. Yes, diarist. Um... Well, one says peeps. Peeps it is. And now Nancy's dead. We often discover what will do by finding out what will not do. And probably he who never made a mistake never made a discovery. Oh, dear. It's deep philosophical stuff, isn't no, it? No, not at all. It's all in the family. Mrs. Beaton? No. Wrong one. <laughs> Samuel Smiles? Yes. <laughs> Self-help? Yes. <laughs> Frank Muir, consider what a great girl you are. Consider what a long... <laughs> <laughs> you really at me tonight, Jack, really. Consider what a long way you've come today. <laughs> consider what a clock it is. Consider anything. Only don't cry. Consider what a clock it is. <laughs> <laughs> is it one of my relations? <laughs> <laughs> consider what a great girl you are. Is it Alice? Yes, it is. Well, there we are. It's Alice. In? In, uh, in the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Alice, wrong book. Alice through. Alice through. Alice through the looking glass. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Lutwidge Dodson, <coughs> Lewis Carroll, Alice through the looking glass. And so we come to the last round, which is a bit complicated. Um, we give, I give two quotations... And I ask uh, Arnold Robertson to identify one and Nancy Spain to identify the other. And while they're doing that, or trying to do it, I invite Frank Muir and Dennis Norton to think of a situation to which the words might originally have applied. So one mark for each correct answer from Nancy and Arnott, and a mark to either Dennis Norton or Frank Muir to be awarded by you, the audience. Now we begin tonight with Nancy Spain, and the phrase is, all is lost except honour. Well, it was a battle of some sort. Yes. Um, probably a very famous battle. <laughs> Unsuccessful battle, but some. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> it was probably said in some foreign language. It was? By the defeated. Yes. Tu es perdu, mais seulement l'honneur. So. So, Lanoir. Force, Lanoir. Force, Lanoir. Yes. Well, in that case, it would obviously be French. I remember good. we were mustard at Cressy. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those very foreign wars that the French fought. Yes, it was Francis I of France in a letter to his mother on the morning after the disastrous Battle of Pavia. Pavia. Uh, yes. What he really oh, said God. was, in fact, not. Uh, sure, all no is more. lost except honour, <laughs> but nothing remains to me save honour and life, which was not quite so gallant. And now, Arnold Robertson, the phrase, from the sublime to the ridiculous. Well, now, that's the kind of thing that's also said in wars, and I never can remember whether things were said by... Napoleon or by Wellington because from fighting against one another so much they, they, they talked extraordinarily alike. Well have a go. They wore the same <laughs> hat too. <laughs> <laughs> so one was one way and, and the boots. <laughs> the boots were the same. Napoleon. Napoleon it was. Ah. 
Um, Napoleon, on his return from Russia after the disastrous retreat from Moscow, which was a descent from the sublime to the ridiculous, to a chap whom I've never heard of before called the Abbe Duprat. And now, Dennis Norden, what really happened uh, when the phrase, all is lost except honour, originated? All is lost except honour brings back the very first job I had when I left school. I took a job for which I was really physically quite unsuited. Chambermaid. <laughs> um, not, not in a hotel. It was at the Chamber of Horrors <coughs> at um, a, a distinguished waxworks in London called Madame Tussauds. <laughs> Um, and my job was um, dusting the effigies and waxworks in the Chamber of Horrors. <laughs> I wasn't happy, and I, and I went to Madame Tussaud, and I explained that I wasn't happy, and, and she said, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to do something more creative. I, I'd always been that sort of person, you know. And she said, well, would you like to go into the department where they actually make the waxworks? Well, this sounded jolly interesting, you know, so I said yes, and I went... And, and, and I went to this department where they um, put the hair on the heads of the models. You know, these people there are called, I have a very strange nomenclature, they're called hair put on us. <laughs> uh, and um, every hair on all these models is put on individually. Did, did you know that? Um, do you know, and uh, this, this immediately I saw it, the, the expertise, the craftsmanship fascinated me, and um, I, I plumped this. I said, this is what I'd like to do. And so they handed me a model. They said, we've got a new model coming in to the um, Hall of Great Literary People, and it was a model of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And she was completely bald, you see, waiting for the hair to be put on, uh, and they said, well, there you are, put hair on that. And I looked at this, this model of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and I thought, there's only one thing for you. We've got to soften you up. So I switched on the electric fire, and I laid her down very gently in front of the fire, and um, I went out for a cup of tea. And um, then I met um, a great pal of mine there, and he said, there's a good film, and film. Anyway, I got back about half past 11, and there was Liz. And it really was rather awful. She'd been left there much too long. <laughs> and everything was dissolved into sort of liquid <laughs> from this heat, you see. And I, I knew I'd had it. I knew this job wasn't for me at that moment. <laughs> and I had to explain to Madam, and I couldn't dare face her, and I had to think of a telegram which tell her that her precious Elizabeth Bar Browning had completely melted and I was no longer in her employ. <laughs> So I sent this telegram, which, as I say, reminded me of this phrase, and the telegram said, All Liz lost. <laughs> Ex hair put on her. <laughs> well, that was chambers of, Chamber of Horrors, wasn't it? <laughs> And now, for Frank Muir, the phrase, from the sublime to the ridiculous. My story is rather different. It's just a bold statement of fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it concerns gardening. Um, when, when we moved into our house, there was a lot of grass, which is that green stuff, you know, and um, some trees, which are also green, but on the end of a pole. And <laughs> <laughs> um, my wife particularly wanted a flower bed. And I, I thought I'd rather go into this, you know. I saw myself as a horny-headed son of toil, you know. And I read up on the subject beforehand because I wanted to do it properly. So I went to a gardening shop and I inquired there about compost and, and, and various... Um, asking your pardon, manures. And he... <laughs> There, apparently because this composting business you know and people make a fetish of it it has to be everything has to be organic and they go mad there's a sort of non compost mentis about it and they, <laughs> and, and, but the chap put me straight this fellow in the shop he said no we, you use lime but not ordinary lime we have a special it's all bagged up and it's very clean to handle and friable and it's called super lime and it contains hypophosphates and essential minerals 
And I, I took it home, bore it home, and read all these, these uh, weird things it had in it. And I found for my gardening book that before applying my super lime, I had to dig the flower bed a spit deep. <laughs> it's a puzzling phrase, you know, when you first come across it. I mean, how deep? I mean, well, how... I finally realized what it was, of course, and I... I <laughs> There's an old inn in the village, and they've got a spit above the fireplace, and I measured it, and it was about five foot six. <laughs> so, so I dug the flower bed over to a depth of five foot six, you see. <laughs> and, um, and then I spread my, my super lime all over that. The next thing was to hold the surface and prepare it for the seed bed. So having hoed, I planted out bedding plants, which I'd bought at great expense, and I planted them very carefully with a dibbler, and the seeds I used a drill, which is the proper thing to I used a quarter inch drill. It took a <laughs> t- tremendous length of flex back to the house. But I, I did want to do it properly, and I measured out all the little seeds and put them in. And we sat back and waited. And you know, that you should see that, that flower bed today. It, it is one glorious mass of colour brown. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I, I planted it the full five feet down, but nothing, <laughs> nothing had come up at all, except one thing, actually. My, my small son wanted to get in, get in on this gardening. He bought a threepenny packet of ranuncular seeds, and he planted it, seed packet and all, and there was this beautiful bunch, right in the middle of the beautiful bunch, glorious bunch of ranunculars. And that, I'm afraid, is the complete story of my flower bed. From the super lime to the ranunculus. <laughs> well, I think Frank now gets home on that story by a very short head. And that uh, brings us to a final score in which the two teams are only one mark apart. Very close indeed. And Nancy Spain and Dennis Norton win with that one mark ahead, and Arnold Robertson and Frank Miller, one mark less. He's second. Second. <laughs> In my word, you heard E. Arnold Robertson, Nancy Spain, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longman. The program, which came from the Radcliffe Infirmary, Oxford, was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. (laughs) ¶¶